right, well, hey, that was awesome, right? Give another round of applause. Man, that's so cool. You know what, I think uh, Jesus thinks your words are important. Uh, follow him and get baptized. Let's pray. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We are like, oh, let's go? No. Uh, man, thank you guys. Thank you students for being down here. So good, man. If you want to get connected with baptism, maybe you're thinking about baptism, would you just reach out to us, fill out one of our connect cards, let somebody at the Welcome Center know. We just want to invite you to that. All right, well, for today then, um, if we haven't met before, my name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. I get to help with our give it away mission stuff. And so, man, and thank you again for uh, praying. Thanks for praying for uh, the Mexico team that uh, was not able to go down. They should have been at a, um, at a church in Mexico right now, hearing the word from uh, Jordan, one of our guys, but that's not the case. And that's okay. God has a different plan. We're going to figure out what that plan is eventually, <laughs> but we'll just keep figuring that out. So continue to pray for them. Pray for shoulder to shoulder, our uh, partnership in Mexico, and thank you for that. But for this weekend, we're, fin- we're continuing, we're not finishing, we're continuing uh, something we've been calling broken religion. It's actually kind of uh, a little bit in a part of what we've been talking about through the Sermon on the Mount. And so this famous like teaching of Jesus as he taught on the Sermon on the Mount. And so in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, we're calling it broken religion. And all that to say that, bro- uh, that religion isn't really a bad thing. It's just kind of a misused thing. Uh, the problem with religion in the case of following after the way of Jesus and his teaching isn't, much, isn't really about Jesus and his way of teaching. The problem comes when you introduce messed up people into the equation, people like me and people that, man, if you're like me, that we try to follow after Jesus, but we break things, we misinterpret things, and we get things wrong. We are imperfect, okay? And so that is, that's what happens with broken religion. So... Today, we're going to talk specifically about words, okay? We're going to talk about words. And if you were to Google search how many words do you speak in a typical uh, day, you'll find a range from about 7,000 to 15,000 words, okay? Unless you're my children, they do that in like, uh, right, like at about 8 a.m. every morning. They, they probably hit that quota. So some of us talk more than others, right? But um, about that, about 7,000 to 15,000 words. So I bring that up because I would love for us to just pause for a second even, and just to think. Let's just pause for a moment. Think about those thousands of words. Think about even the words that you've spoken today. Um, How did we spend those words? How did we spend them? How many of those words were filled with honesty, integrity, truthfulness? How many of those words were filled with meaning? Were they meaningless? And so no guilt, no shame, just, just think about that. Think about the way that we often use our words. Are we intentional? with our every word. How, and maybe another good question, set of questions is, how do people view us because of our word? Maybe even more importantly, if you're a follower of Jesus, how do people view Jesus because of your word? And so let's think about that just for a second. Okay, there's another thing I want you to think about. Um, I found this stat here. Um, I was looking this up. There's a Gallup study um, called Honesty and Ethics Rating of Clergy, slides to new low. This was a study done in 2013. It says, Americans' rating of the honesty and ethics of the clergy has fallen to 47%. The first time this rating has dropped below 50% since Gallup first asked about the clergy in 1977. Clergy have historically ranked near the top among professions on this measure, hitting a high rating of 67% in 1985. And I I don't know, but I bet that if this study was done more recently, that it would probably be a way lower percentage. And I think it's probably about the same for Christians in general. After all, those of us that are in ministry, those of us that are followers of Jesus, those of us are human beings in general, (laughs) we have this tendency to go against our word. We have this tendency to sometimes lie. We have this tendency to protect our integrity even by means of covering up reality or lying or subtly breaking promises. If you're like me, we have that tendency. We, we would rather do whatever we can to get whatever we want. And so we use our words in those ways sometimes. And so when we get back into Jesus' teaching on this matter, I think what we're gonna see is that our words are actually immensely important. They're really important, and they're really significant in how um, you impact others, and how others view you, and how others view the God that we say that we follow. So let's do this. Let's turn to Matthew 5. If you have a Bible, I'd love for you to to go there, or a Bible app. We're going to be in Matthew 5, like we have been for a while now, um, but we're going to be in verse 33 
verse, starting with verse 33. So while you're getting there, I'm not going to have it on the board initially. I'm just going to read it out loud. We'll go back to it verse by verse. But while you're getting there, your, uh, your Bible might title this section Oaths or Vows. And so this is just another classic teaching that Jesus sets out to kind of correct misconceptions from the religious leaders and their distortion of some of the law. And you'll hear Jesus use oaths, uh, vows, and swearing kind of interchangeably to get to the point of being true to your word or your words. And there's slight differences to each of them. An oath, for example, um, you might think of something like this. It's usually something made under the authority of someone, namely God, uh, like the classic hand on the Bible in the courtroom so that you'll be honest. Um, A vow, so you'll hear Jesus use vow. A vow is a solemn promise to do a specific thing, often associated with weddings, and so something like that. And then swearing. Jesus will talk about swearing. And not to be confused with cursing or using bad words, um, he's talking about a statement or promise that you'll do something or that something is true. And the best thing I can think about is like when, Lo- when A. Loki uh, tells you that he swears that, you're gonna t- that he's going to tell the truth this time around, okay? So three other people are watching this with me. Good job. All right. Uh, so we'll come back on Wednesday and see what happens. All right. Anyways, you're welcome for the nerves out there. I love you. Okay. (laughs) Yes, sir. All right. Matthew 5. This is the real good stuff. Okay. So Matthew 5, I'm going to read it for us here. This is Jesus speaking. And he says in verse 33, again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything else, anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Okay, that is what Jesus says here in this context. So let's look at this. Let's go back kind of verse by verse here a little bit. Back at 33, let's hone on this part right here. Jesus is talking to the religious leaders, the scribes. He says, again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago. Don't break your oath. Fulfill it to the Lord, the vows that you've made. This, by the way, is like a summarization of the Old Testament. And so Jesus is saying to these guys, look, again, you should know the Old Testament. You guys are like the pros. You get paid to like know the Old Testament and to have people trust you, to teach them the law and the words of God. And so has God not made it plain what you ought to do and not to do? So Jesus has to summarize several places in the Old Testament for them again, and he does. And so these are likely the places that Jesus is summarizing. Let's take a look at some of them. Leviticus 19, verse 12. You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Okay, so what's he saying? He's saying, don't take an oath knowing that you may or may not be able to fulfill it because you're not gonna be just hurting that person. You're actually hurting the relationship that you have with God as well when you are not true to your word. Next up, Numbers 30, verse two. If a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Pretty straightforward, like do the thing you said, okay? Easy enough. Deuteronomy 23, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what has passed your lips, for you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. Jesus seems to take this very seriously that when you make a vow, you should fulfill it quickly. And actually, while we're at it, maybe don't do it at all because we can't trust ourselves a lot of the time to fulfill things. And so, man, like that's something to consider there. And no, like when we say things out of our lips, we're not just saying it to other people, but we're saying this in front of God as well. So Jesus takes it seriously. And so that's what Jesus is doing. He's saying, guys, you know the Old Testament. Here, let me remind you. Here's a summary of what you ought to know. Okay, here it is. And then he'll move on to verse 34. And again, he'll say, but, but I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, 
either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, for you can't make even one hair white or black, okay? Jesus is now directing the attention from the Old Testament law toward how the religious leaders are instead using the law, and he's trying to show them the heart of the law. Okay, so to get some more context for you for this and what Jesus is really trying to do here, I want to bring up something called the Mishnah. Anybody ever heard the Mishnah before? Just now? Okay, cool. This is the Mishnah, okay, so you can see it. And I think it's going to help us understand the context of where Jesus is, what Jesus is talking to specifically, to the Pharisees and scribes. And I actually need to back up again a little bit further, okay? I'm going to actually tell you about the Torah. Has anybody heard of the Torah before? Okay, just now? Okay, good. This is great. You guys are learning some new stuff. Some of you are good. The Torah, it just refers to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis to Deuteronomy. And in it are all the laws and practices for Israel and how they ought to live, things that they ought to abide by, and things that they should be doing, okay? Now, since that wasn't enough, the rabbis, they got together and they made the Mishnah, which just means repetition or repetitive study, which was to supplement the Torah, which was to supplement Genesis to Deuteronomy, meaning the Mishnah was, provide, was created to provide various interpretations or counter-interpretations of the meaning of the law in the Torah. Okay, if I'm still not making sense, in other words, they decided to make rules about the rules so that they could follow the rules. Okay, so that's what they're doing. And so this picture, by the way, is the Zeraim, and this is like, this is like seriously, like, they're like, hey, if you have seeds, here's how you plant them. This is the law. This is how you got to do it. This is how you got to plant various different seeds, okay? And there's other things called the Talmud and all that kind of stuff. Those last two things I told you, they're not really important in this conversation, but there's some nerd out there who's happy about it. So there you go. Okay, fellow nerds, there we go. But what we should know about the Mishnah is that what they were trying to do is they're trying to parse out the teaching, the law on vows. And they're trying to parse it out in a way of saying, okay, let's, let's make binding vows, semi-binding vows, and non-binding vows. For example, here's an example from the Mishnah, it's called the Nedarim, and it says this, if a man is forbidden by vow to have any benefit from his fellow, and he had not to eat, his fellow may go to the shopkeeper and say, so-and-so is forbidden by vow to have any benefit from me, and I do not know what I shall do. Then the shopkeeper may give food to the one and take payment from the other. Okay, basically, this discusses a circumstance where two friends, maybe they got into a quarrel, and one of them vowed, you, you're not going to ever benefit from me again. Get out of my face. We're not doing this thing. I vow for you not to, to come near me. You can't have anything in my property. And that friend gets into financial difficulty. He needs to find a way to eat. And since you cannot break your vow no matter what, the Mishnah kind of allowed a workaround, a loophole, if you will, so that a vow can be kept, but you're like still good with God, Okay. So the Mishnah, they kind of set up these bypassing rules so that he could help his friend without breaking his vow. So the shopkeeper, not being in the vow, can voluntarily provide to the needy and just incidentally charge the other guy, right? And it's like, okay, we're good now. Didn't have to break any vows. I still help my friend. He's good. We're good. You got to wonder, like, is that the heart of God for vows and oaths, that we would just try to make these workarounds? that we would try to find a workaround so that maybe, maybe this guy is like, like saying, man, I wish I didn't do that. I wish I could help my friend, but I can't because I did this vow. Let's do this workaround, okay? It's very interesting because it reminds me of Deuteronomy 15. Check this out. Check out Deuteronomy 15. If you have a Bible, go there again for me. Um, I'm not going to have this on the screen. I'm just going to read from a, from a real-life Bible right here. And so if you want to get there, you can. It's chapter 15, verse 7 to 11. So check this out. In, in light of that kind of loophole vow, hear what God has to say. This is interesting. This is something I find, find cool. Verse 7. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts, is near, so that you do not show ill will toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then, because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. 
There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. Okay, so here's the dilemma, okay? We gotta think which is binding and which is not binding. What is, is the vow that this guy made, is that binding to him? Or is the law binding? And what happens when those things contradict each other? After all, God says, don't break a vow. So this guy, he's like trying not to break a vow. However, God also says that the Lord has given you land. You shouldn't harden your heart to the poor, but you should give freely, you should do that. The guy, see the guy made a man-made vow that he can't break, that inadvertently had already broken God's law. He made a vow that he really shouldn't have. But now he has to keep his word. And so they make the mission to find loopholes so that they don't have to sin. So they don't have to make a mess of what they already did. So they can kind of keep their word, but kind of not. Maybe we can understand this difficulty, this difficult situation. Um, trying to follow Jesus while mixed with your own opinions, your own thoughts, our emotions, mixed with like cultural norms, social pressures. Which of these things are right? Do you ever get in a scenario like that? Admittedly, the answer is not always so easy. It's not easy to decipher sometimes. I have one last example from the Mishnah that was brought up by this guy named uh, Ishay Rosenzvi. He's a professor of Hebrew culture. I thought this was so weird. Let's just show you what these guys ha- went through to get the Mishnah going. This is so interesting. He says, if one says to his wife, behold, you are like my mother to me, he must be given an opening on other grounds in order that he should not act lightly in such matters. This is what's weird. Apparently, this guy was saying that this was a proposed vow from the husband in an attempt to forbid his wife from having sex with him, okay? And I'm like, I don't know any dudes making a vow like that, okay? I've heard of guys being mom, maybe feeling mom by their wife before, but never this far. Can you imagine that conversation? Like, you know what? Tired of you mom and me. Tired of you treating me like a child. No more sex, I'm out, <laughs> okay? It's, it's just weird. Like, what, what are they doing? And by the way, I know we were like done with the sex and marriage talk already, so I'm sorry. We'll move on, okay? That was a couple weeks ago. But here's, here's the point. I think this is very interesting. The point that Jesus is trying to make is that he's observing these rules on top of rules. Some of them are weird. Some of them are like, just what are we doing? And he's seeing people trying to find loopholes in his law, seeing people trying to, find, trying to interpret the law to whichever they feel is best for them, um, regardless of what God has intended or what God has set out for us as right. And so Jesus says, in that case then, don't swear at all. If that's how we're gonna act, like just don't swear at all. Just don't do it. They're trying to say, look, well, if we make promises by heaven, that's really binding. Like if I make a promise about heaven or, or um, under God or anything like that, that's gonna be really binding. Maybe there's a situation where it's like, gosh, that's, that's too much. I don't know if I can fulfill my promise. So maybe we'll do semi-binding things. Okay, see what Jesus, he's, he's getting after what these guys are thinking. And the Pharisees and scribes are like, well, we'll just, we'll just do vows on earth as well, like things on earth we can vow over or take oaths on, and that'll be semi-binding. Or if we're really unsure if we can fulfill something, then we'll just swear by our own head, our own self, and then that way it's not buying at all. It's kind of like we can make a promise and keep it or not, and we'll be okay, right? And Jesus is saying, if that's how you're gonna do things, just don't swear at all. Maybe speak less. <laughs> Maybe don't do that. And Jesus is saying, no, let's remember the scripture. Again, he's like, again, guys, you know the Old Testament. Let me summarize it again for you. You know the Old Testament. Let's go back to that. Let's go back to the scripture as our authority. And it's funny that Jesus says, how can you promise something? How can you swear on your own head when you can't even control whether your hair turns black or white? You have no control of normal things, let alone what you try to bind and not bind. The fact is that we, unlike God, we are emotional. We change. We change our mind so often. Like that example earlier with the the quarreling people. The feelings that we have today toward our friend who we promised such and such, we may have changed feelings later on. And when feelings and emotions are mixed in, what oftentimes can happen is that we want to find loopholes in God's word or his law, even if we know what he says. And that's where religion gets broken. So, personally, I've been really trying to figure out, man, what is this, man, I'm trying to think through this in our context today, like, what does this mean for us a little bit? I'm thinking, well, maybe it's like 
subtle things. Maybe it's like when you have good intentions but bad follow through. For example, have you ever said somebody uh, to somebody, maybe even in the cafe, um, like, hey, oh man, we need to get together. But you've been saying that every week for the last several months. It's like, well, you're going to get together or not. And I'm guilty of this. I just talked to two guys from last service. I was like, yeah, and you're going to talk to me afterwards, right? And so that, that happens. I, I, can we just be true to our word? If, if I really want to hang out with these people, would I make time? Or maybe I just make, say, no, I can't. I can't do that. Or what about when you say to someone that I'll pray for you? And they never did. I'm happy to report someone yesterday said they were going to pray for me this morning. And they texted me this morning and said that they really did. So that was great. True to his word. Trustworthy man. So these are small scale examples, but they can add up to a reputation of dishonesty, to our word being cheap, or to someone being untrustworthy, known as untrustworthy. What, what if you're a business owner? Is, is your word trustworthy to your workers, to your vendors? Do you follow through on what you say that you'll do? What if you're engaged or married? Are you living up to your commitments or your vows to God and to each other? What about those of us who are in debt? We signed off, we had agreed that we would pay this thing. Are we living up to that? Are we people of our word? So, the 7,000 words, think about that. Are they honest each day? Are they meaningful? Do we follow through on what we say? I'm sure we've all felt both extremes. The extreme of being lied to, having promises broken to you, the hurt and the pain that comes with that. I'm sure we've also felt the comfort and joy of people that we know that we can trust, we can be honest with, who will keep their promises. I'm sure we've seen both extremes. You're probably thinking of examples now. Well, finally, Jesus concludes on something that is, I think, really interesting. He says this. Let's just make this thing simple. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Say yes or say no. Do the thing you said you'll do or don't say that you would do it at all. Be true to your word. If you know you're busy, you can't take on another thing. Just be honest. Just say that. Don't suggest that you can do more. Say, I actually can't do something right now, whatever it is. Another interesting thing that I found, um, sometimes, even to this day, I think, some Jewish people, they might say this word, bali nader, okay? Before promising or suggesting that they would do something. Bali means without, nader means vow or oath. So literally, they would be saying, um, without oath, I will do such and such thing. Okay, real promising, right? And so I'm like, okay, the Jewish people aren't as clever as we, as we think because we've done this too. You ever, when you were a child and you like made a promise, but you did this like behind your back, you know, even you like cross your toes sometimes. I don't know how you do that, but yeah, we're childish. We do the same thing. It's silly. Just be true to your word. Here's a few pieced together quotes that one commentator I was reading said that I just have to present to us today. He says this about Jesus' teaching. He says, what Jesus emphasized in his teaching was that honest men and women do not need to resort to oaths. And it was not that they should refuse to take an oath if required by some external authority to do so either. So some people, even today, I think some denominations even, they in light of Jesus' teaching, they say, well, I'm, we're, just, we're not going to do oaths at all. We don't do that. Can't do it, won't do it ever. Okay? And I don't think Jesus is saying that. He's just saying, like, man, why try to convince somebody that your word is good? Just be good to your word. Let that be seen. Let that be known. So that we have no reason to make a vow if our word is true and trustworthy. So I don't think that it means that we can't take any vows at all. Um, God made oaths and vows. Jesus made oaths and vows. Paul made those. And by the way, I don't know how, how you get a house, a car, or a smartphone without agreements or vows, right? You have to do these things. All, all he's saying is just live up to what you agree to or don't agree to it at all. Next, we'll go on to say that oaths arise because men are so often liars. I don't know if you think that's true. I found this to be true. I mean, I'm thinking about my kids again. Like, it's so true. Like, man, and maybe this is like God trying to show his children the way to be disciplined and not to be liars. He's like, I'm gonna create oaths so we can figure this thing out. You guys need discipline. I'd see that with my children, right? I never had to teach them how to be liars or to lie. They've just found out how to do that really well, by the way, on their own. And so for me, I'm continually trying to show them how to be honest, how to be true to their word. My wife, she has this phrase that she brought up for her family. She says, man, hey, when something happens, she'd be like, hey, let's try to be a man of honor. Let's be a man of honor. Let's be true to our word. 
And so that's, that's something to think through. Last part of this from John Stott. He says, and I think this is an interesting twist to this too. He says, the same is true of all forms of exaggeration, hyperbole, and the use of superlatives. We are not content to say that we had an enjoyable time. We have to describe it as fantastic or fabulous or even fantabulous or some other invention. But the more we resort to such expressions, the more we devalue human language and human promises. Christians should say what they mean and mean what they say. Our unadorned word should be enough, yes or no. And when a monosyllable will do, why waste our breath by adding to it? Shame to say that I Googled monosyllable, but I just realized right before I did that I actually knew what that meant. It just seemed like a big word. Anyways, okay. So I love what he's saying. He's like, I still have to think about this because I'm like, man, yeah, do we do value human language and promise with these other fillers that we say? Is our, is our word meaningful? When we say something's awesome, is it really awesome? Do we just like to say that? I say that all the time. That's awesome, right? So it's interesting. But again, the point is how do we use our words? Are they intentional? Are they cheap? Are they meaningful? Are they meaningless? Do they hold value? And Jesus finishes to say something else that's really interesting. He says this. I just have to highlight this. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Wow. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. I was wrestling with this phrase here um, when, when Jesus was talking about this, and man, I, I was wrestling with it so hard, I was like, um, there's this guy who disciples me, his name's Rick, he's actually one of our elders, he's so smart and wise, and I was going through this uh, stuff with him, and I got to this part, I was like, Rick, man, what do you think about this? And he said something so good. You ever interact with an older man or woman, and they're just so wise that they say something to you, and you're like, I don't quite know what you're I'm gonna write that down because I know it's awesome, but I gotta think about that, all right? This is that guy, he did one of those again. So I wrote it down and I'm like, man, this is what he said about this. He said, to God, our thoughts are our words. The evil one, he cannot read your thoughts. So to him, your words are your thoughts. And this is why you are wise to be reserved with your words and to keep your thoughts in the right place. Think about that, man, it's so wise so true. It actually reminded me of Ecclesiastes 5. I'm not going to read it to you, although maybe we should spend uh, some time doing that, but I just want to summarize this one part in Ecclesiastes 5. It's so good. He's talking about vows, and there's one point where he says, God is in heaven, you're on earth, so speak less, okay? That's like my summarizing of it, but that's basically what he says. I'm like, gosh, you're right. If I said less, things might actually go really better for me sometimes, right? So man, that's just something to think through here. You're wise to be reserved with your words. Make your yes, yes, and your no, no. Okay, so what should we do with this teaching from Jesus and practicing his, his way and his word on these things? I have a couple thoughts, and so I want to invite the, van, the band up. And so as they come up, I want to say just a couple, couple passing thoughts here on how we can respond to Jesus' teaching this way. I think the first way, and I think this goes for followers of Jesus and for those that are not followers of Jesus, but I think it's really important to understand, to know, to realize for yourself that God keeps his word, that God's word is trustworthy. And when I say God's word, I also refer to his word, the scripture here. So I wanna take you to Hebrews real quick. Hebrews 6, verse 13 to 20 again. I'm just gonna read out loud for you. Feel free to get there. It's not going to be on the board, but I'm going to read from the scripture here. Hebrews 6, verse 13, says this. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged." We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. 
It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so God, he, he has taken oath on the highest authority possible, himself. And he said, I'm gonna bless you. He said this to Abraham. I'm gonna bless you. I'm gonna bless your descendants. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're part of that spiritual uh, family. You're part of that family. And those promises are for you too. Remember that. God's promise, his word, things that he has given to us in his word. There's promises all over here. Would you read those? Would you look at those? Would you remember those? Those are for you. Sometimes you have to wait for them. Abraham, Abraham had to wait a long while for that thing to happen. But man, God is good to his word and he is trustworthy. And so if you're not a follower of Jesus here today, I just wanna say, man, above anything else, you can hear what other followers of Jesus say and hopefully their word is trustworthy, but they're imperfect too. But man, would you trust in God's word? Would you like take a look at it? If you don't have a Bible, grab one, take one of ours. Download the Bible app. Look through his word, look through his promises. God says that he, if you follow after him, you trust in him, then he will make you heirs to his kingdom that lasts forever. And that's true. And that's an invitation for you. And we would urge you to come and see for yourself how good Jesus really is and how good his word is. And lastly, see this as an invitation and a reminder for you to simply keep your yes, yes, and no, no. Uh, and I realize that's way easier said than done. But let's think about this. Do we have commitments unfilled? Maybe you're thinking about some commitments, some promises you've made in the past. Maybe they're unfilled, unfulfilled. It's not too late to fulfill those. It's not too late to go back to those. It's not too late to turn your habits. Maybe you have a habit, a reputation of being untrustworthy. It's not too late to pray, to ask the Lord and the Spirit to help you with those things and to maybe just say today, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at those 7,000, 15,000 words. Maybe I'm gonna say less. <laughs> and maybe I'm gonna take meaning to those words and be true to them. Because as I speak, the Lord hears us. I'm gonna be true to him and to those that hear my word, to change my mind, to keep my word, to fulfill unkept promises. Think about that in your workplace, your school, your family, or online, wherever you might be. Do people find you honest and trustworthy? Can they trust your word? And if they do, if people can trust your word, then when you tell somebody about Jesus and tell them about this word that is more trustworthy than anything, just maybe they'll, they'll believe you and trust you because they've built that relationship with you. Okay, lastly, there's a song we're about to sing, and I love this song. This song is called Yes and Amen. It's actually a song that I, uh, I actually sing it to my daughter every night. I will never sing to anybody else except for my daughter, okay? And this is the one that I, and please don't tell my wife to record me because that'll be embarrassing. But I sing this song to my daughter every night. I love this song. And just so you know, amen means I agree or let it be so. And so I wanna encourage us in kind of an interesting way. I'm actually gonna ask us to stand now, okay? We'll stand now and we'll start to engage uh, the song here in a second. But I want us to think about this. We're gonna sing the song, Yes and Amen. And what it's yes and amening to, what it's yes and agreeing to, is that I will follow Jesus and his commandments, that I will obey him. And for some of you, maybe you shouldn't sing the song, honestly. But for those of you who are ready to be true to your word, and true to follow after Jesus, you sing these songs loudly. You say yes and amen, and be true to your word, to the Lord and to others. Let's pray. Yeah, Jesus, thank you, God, that you are so deeply concerned with us that you are even concerned with our words. God, we, we have this language, we have these, these many words that we can use for any kind of different purpose. But God, I pray that we would take account of that, that we would be true to our word, especially those of us who are followers of Jesus, that we would be known to be truthful, that we wouldn't have to plead for someone to believe us, but that we would just show, even with our actions, that our word is trustworthy and true, so that when someone does ask us about the gospel, they may even look to your word and believe that it is true as well. And God, if someone is here and they're not sure, God, I just, I just ask them to, to read your word, to read your promises, and to see that you are true and trustworthy. God, that you put an oath out there that you would love us and bless us and bring us into your kingdom as heirs. 
And that's an invitation to anybody who would believe and put their trust in you. So God, yes and amen to that. God, as we sing, I pray that uh, for anybody who's just not ready to sing, that there's no guilt, no shame. But God, for those of us who can look at that and say, yes, I, I want to do what you say, and what you say is good. Yes and amen. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.